is Peter Jackson. I'm here to present an introduction to spatial programming. A couple of, uh, couple of notes before I get started. Um, if you saw me give a similar talk at Mount Ruby about a month ago, there is still time to go see what the rock and music was about. This is going to be a very similar presentation. There's some more material, but the, uh, the guts are the same. Uh, second point of order is uh, there's a bit of time at the end for some questions. People who ask questions are going to be first in line to get free t-shirts. So I've got a bunch of t-shirts down the front here. I'm going to be giving those away after my talk. So, like I said, my name is Pete Jackson. I work for Intridia, and I'm here to talk about an introduction to geospatial programming. These are the topics I'm going to cover. I'm going to go over what spatial programming is. I'm going to talk about some important background terms in, in the spatial space. Talk about tools in the Ruby and in the Rails spatial stack. And then talk a bit about how to get started with spatial programming. So, spatial programming. In a nutshell, it is exposing space as a first order programming concept. It is dealing with the distances and the sizes and shapes of things as if it were uh, built in to your, to your language. Um, it's, it, when you do spatial programming, you get rich built-in support for shapes, sizes, and the relationships between things. When I talk about describing things spatially, these are some of the things you can describe spatially. Locations on the Earth, the geometric equations, the shapes of buildings, parts in an assembly, positions of things, uh, where your chess pieces are, anything that basically breaks the mold of your typical object relational database. I think we're all pretty familiar with, uh, with, we're all pretty familiar with applications where we store things like customer records and orders and warehouses and items and customers have orders and orders have items and so on. That's a very relational concept. But when we start taking a step beyond and asking things like, what warehouse is closest to my customer? What is the route we can take to service the most customers the fastest? Then we start to get into spatial programming. So here's some of the kinds of questions you can answer using spatial programming logic. Find the components of a vehicle close to the fuel line that emit heat. Again, uh, it has to do with the distances between things and the relationships and sizes of objects uh, to other objects. And note that it doesn't necessarily have to be about a place on the Earth. It can just be the components of a blueprint. If you feed a blueprint into a spatial logic system, you can ask your system questions like this. Uh, the second question is more of a marketing question. You probably run across this one. This is one of the ones you'll run across first if you start, uh, start applying spatial logic and spatial thinking to your applications. Then the third one is also a marketing and sales type of question. Find competitors within 10 miles of a road, where there's an available billboard within 20 miles on that road. So these are, the, these are the types of questions you can ask of a spatial system that are a little bit more difficult to answer when you're thinking relationally. So that's what I mean when I talk about uh, spatial programming. What I want to do now is go through a few background terms that are pretty important to get if you're going to jump into spatial programming and, and location-based or spatial-based applications. We go through each of these in turn, so I'm not going to read this to you, but these are the, these are the key terms that I'm going to spend some time talking about. First, a GIS. Um, a GIS system is a system that visually represents data. And there are a number to choose from. They're, they're often desktop applications, but every time you uh, embed a map in a web page and drop a dot on it, you're also building a little teeny GIS system. Um, I wanted to throw up some examples here because uh, these are all, uh, for the most part, they're not all, but most of these are open source and freely available, very powerful geographic information system <coughs> tools. Uh, on the top left is a system called GRASS. On the, that's also what's on the bottom left. On the top right is uh, ArcGIS for iPad, which is either free or cheap, but it's a very powerful, um, very powerful tool you can play around with. And the, Bottom center is another look at ArcGIS, and then on the bottom right is probably the most powerful GIS system that nobody uses. It's NASA's WorldWind uh, GIS package, and it's pretty complicated to use, but you can do an awful lot with it. And just because it's built in, just because the toolkit is built in Java, that doesn't make it evil. 
it's still pretty darn good. So I'd encourage you to jot those down and maybe check them out. Of course, I think everybody's familiar with the most widely used GIS system, which is the Googles. Uh, Google Maps and Google Earth are very popular and brought GIS technology to the masses. So I think everybody's pretty familiar with the kinds of things that you can display in Google Earth and Google Maps. But I would like to, uh, one of the points of my talk today is to get you thinking a little bit further than just dropping a pin on a map. And we'll see how to do that a little bit later. Another, uh, another shot of Google Earth. All right, layering. Um, the next important background term to understand if you're going to do spatial programming is the concept of layering. If you're going to build a spatial application, um, one of the important things that you want to think about and learn how to do is build layers of information and let, put them on top of each other and display them in such a way that you tell a story. So, just like in Photoshop, spatial tools let you layer together raster and vector data. Raster data being like a JPEG or a picture, and then vector data being like a, um, a shape file or something you can scale up and down. Let me give you an example of what I mean when I say that you layer things together to tell a story when you're, when you're building a spatial application. This is a desktop GIS system called Quantum GIS, and the story that I'm going to tell today is about uh, an epidemiologist. An epidemiologist is um, someone who's interested in the spread of disease. And the spread of disease is obviously a geographical or location-based question. And if you're trying to do analysis and figure out um, the story behind the spread of a particular vector or disease, you may use a GIS to tell that story. So on the screen here, we have some cases of the measles, the mumps, and chickenpox. It's really hard with the stage over here. I like to run over there and fight the urge. Um, the mumps are on the top right, the measles are on the bottom left, and there's a case of the chicken pox in the middle. So an epidemiologist may look at this map and say, all right, well, I'd really like to understand what's going on here. So let's layer in towns and see how towns cluster with the cases of disease that we're interested in exploring. It doesn't tell us too much, except for that, that mump, the, the mumps cases are clustered around Queenstown in the top right. So, then we might add in where the schools are. See, maybe if some of these childhood diseases are clustered around the schools. Looks like there might be a correlation down on the bottom left um, with the measles cases. There's a lot of schools in the picture though, so it's hard to get the full story. So maybe we add in railways to see if anything came through on a train. Maybe we add in a river's layer to see if something came in by boat. These are the kinds of stories you can start to tell by layering rich data on top of your data points, by adding more information to the picture, and really thinking hard about how you tell the story you're trying to tell and make a uh, proper analysis. A little bit more than a couple of dots on that. Next item I want to give you a little bit of background on before we dive in is uh, a WMS, which is a web mapping service. You'll hear a lot about these once you start diving into custom data sets, and once you start looking for uh, imagery or, or base map layers that are different from your standard uh, Google, Bing, Yahoo map backgrounds. <coughs> you can get tons of base data, tons of stuff to be on the bottom of your map. You just have to go look for it. It's mostly freely available, and the types of information you can get, really you can tailor it to the kinds of applications you're trying, trying to build, the kind of story you're trying to tell, and the kind of problem you're trying to solve. So I'm sure, I'm sure some of you have heard of OpenStreetMap. It's a really, uh, a really good place to go if you want a base layer at, that for an application that's going to teach people how to route around Europe by road. That might not be what you're trying to show, though. Maybe what you want to show is the uh, foliage covering the Earth. In that case, you might want to go to NASA, use their WMS server to pull back imagery of the Earth uh, taken off of the Landsat satellites. You can do that. If you are building the next Navigate Around Town and um, show people how to, get, how to get from place to place application, you, you might grab the Bing base map. 
pretty good. You can see buildings, it's pretty well detailed. The, uh, the pin on this map is actually centered on the, uh, the building for my home Ruby user group in DC. <laughs> There are other sources too. You don't have to go to any of the big providers and you don't have to go to the well-known names. You can actually buy pretty good imagery from commercial sources. This is where it gets expensive. But you can get a really good high resolution picture of, this is the 14th Street Bridge. Um, the bridge connects to DC to Northern Virginia. One of the many bridges that connects to DC to Northern Virginia. Um, there's, there's a lot out there. You just have to hunt for it and find it. And in some cases pay for it. But I would urge you to find the free stuff first. So. What you want to do is make sure you're choosing the best map service for highlighting your data. Okay. Next, I want to go through projection. Projection is uh, a really important concept in spatial programming. It's actually one that most people skip because um, if you're just dropping pins on a Google map, you don't have to deal with it. But when you start um, taking dis disparate data sets and disparate uh, raster imagery and disparate um, vector imagery and putting it all together, then you really have to think about projection. So I'd like to go take just a couple of minutes to tell you about what projection is and why it's important. Um, essentially, the, uh, the Earth is roundish. It's not flat, but your computer screen is flat, and a map made of paper is flat. So there has to be an algorithm for taking that round object and for mapping out all of the points onto a flat surface, and that's called projection. And the reason it's called projection is because if you imagine a light bulb at the center of the Earth, you can see on the left side there, there's sort of a cutaway picture where the uh, sphere of the Earth is cut in half, and it's got a piece of paper wrapped around it, and then there's a light bulb at the center. If you imagine that light bulb casting light outward and uh, casting a shadow everywhere where there's land mass, and then landing on the paper, and then maybe it's photo paper, so the paper turns light or dark in the spots where that shadow landed. Um, if you then unfurl the paper and lay it down, you've got a projection. It's a somewhat accurate representation of what's on a round surface on a flat display. There's a lot of different ways to do projection. You can put the light bulb at the center of the Earth and hold a plane of paper on one side of the Earth. That's a, a polar projection. You can take your light bulb and uh, put it on one side of the earth and shine it through the earth and onto a plane on the other side of the sphere. You can take your piece of paper and you can wrap it around in a cone and stick it on top of the earth and put your light bulb back at the middle of the earth. And then what you've got is a conic projection. When you unfurl it, you'll have a piece of paper shaped like that one on the right. You've seen the uh, I guess the United Nations map, or there, there's, a, there's a map uh, where you're looking down on the northern hemisphere, that's, that's one way to do that. And then the, the type that most people are going to be familiar with is the cylindrical projection, where you take a piece of paper and you wrap it around in a cylinder, you put the earth inside of it, you cast your light out onto the paper that wraps the earth, and then you unfurl the paper. That's the one most of you are going to be familiar with because it is the way that uh, Google Maps and most of the ways you uh, come across on the web will project their data. These are two cylindrical projections, and I'm going to use them to illustrate why it's really important to understand which projection you're using. Uh, if you take the satellite imagery on the left, that's from NASA WorldWind, it's uh, Landsat imagery, it's, it's ground covered. It's pretty cool looking. But what it doesn't have on it, since it's photographs of the Earth, what it doesn't have is country boundary lines, which you can also get as a vector file. If you want to superimpose those two on top of each other, and they are not the same projection, then what will happen is they won't line up, and your application will look goofy. So, a couple of hints when you're dealing with projections. Um, when we get to the part where we talk about spatial databases, uh, when, I, when you see an SRID or a system reference ID, that's uh, roughly equivalent. It's a pointer to the projection type that we're using. When you're in doubt, try one of those two projection types that are listed in the middle of the page. Those are the two most common ones that you'll find in the playground we play in. And uh, when you're dealing with projection codes like EPSG 4326, try not to be too dyslexic like me and uh, get your numbers in the right order because a lot of times if you get the numbers backwards it'll look right 
Okay, the last bit of information I want to go through before we get into the spatial stack is I want to talk about geometry, which is the basic spatial data type. Geometry is that stuff you remember from high school, honest. Points, lines, polygons. When you deal with spatial programming, uh, there's, a, there's a reasonably finite set of geometry types. You can have a point, a line, a polygon, a curve, a multi-line, which is two lines stuck together, a multi-polygon, which is two shapes stuck together, and then a geometry collection, which is a bunch of shapes all melded together. Does that make sense? question is, is it true that a GIS polygon is not quite what we think of as a polygon? Um, in my experience, not really. Not really true. I mean, if you look at the way that they're encoded, if you peek into, uh, if you peek into a, a GIS database and look at what's actually stored in the columns, it's just coordinates of where the corners are. I guess when you add in the fact that you're dealing with projected data, maybe it's a little different, but ultimately... Sure they can, absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's what it's true. Yes, yes, so you could have a star with a hole in the middle, yeah. and that would still be a polygon. That part's true, yes. All right, I wanna talk about the spatial stack real quick because we're, we're gonna get too soon, is how you get started with spatial programming. And in order to do that, you're gonna to have to understand the tools that are in the spatial stack. Let me preface all of this by saying there's lots of tools to choose from. I'm showing you the ones that I like. There are more, and there are better ones and worse ones than these. So I would encourage you to explore a bit, but this is a good place to get started, because this is where the, the most people play. Um, if you're going to be storing data in a database, you need a spatial DBMS. Those are the three big ones, PostGIS, Oracle Spatial, and MySQL Spatial. SQLite also has a spatial uh, extension as well. If, you're gonna, if you have your choice of picking any of these, I would say you should pick PostGIS. Um, spatial adapter, we'll go through a little bit later. Next, let me, let me skip through and tell you what each, each one of these does in turn. Uh, the spatial DBMS is how you store uh, coordinate data in your database. Uh, instead of just ints and, and strings and things like that, it allows you to store the geometry data type in a column. And it also provides spatial functions like distance. So you can take two columns, throw them through the distance function, and get miles and kilometers as your, your result. Again, my recommendation for your spatial DBMS is PostGIS. Oracle Spatial is pretty common in government work, so if you've got to do government work, learn it. And MySQL Spatial is pretty good, but you should use PostGIS if you can. Uh, okay, so when you install your spatial DBMS, this is essentially what you get the capability to do. Now, you can't go to the console and fire up um, MySQL and say select star from states and get this to happen. It would be pretty cool if you did. But in principle, this is what's happening. You're storing an actual shape and a size and a position on the earth in your table right along with string and integer data. Of course, it's not just limited to polygons, it's any geometry type. So you've got lines and point data stored there too. This is actually not where I'm standing. It's where I usually stand though. Um, okay, next tool in the spatial stack is GeoRuby and this is where it starts to get interesting. GeoRuby is the layer where we start exposing the geometry data type within the Ruby language. So it is the package that, oops, sorry. It is the package <coughs> that uh, gives you the line type, the point type, the polygon type, and gives you uh, methods on those types to do interesting spatial things. It also comes with a handful of tools, command line tools. You can convert ESME shapefile data into other things like KML, or if you're dealing with a Google Earth application, or uh, GRSS, or any number of other formats. Spatial adapter is the next tool on the stack, and it is important if you are storing data in a spatial database, and then you want to pull it out and do something with it in, in uh, GeoRuby. So it 
translates columns that are ge of geometry type in your QBMS into actual GeoRuby objects. You need to install this if you want to use Active Record or something like that. It rolls out of your database and then have it be GeoRuby objects. It also supports geometry columns and migrations, which is kind of handy. I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. And just one more note on the spatial adapter. If you're going to use PostGIS or MySQL, grab a spatial adapter that's maintained by Fertility. If you're using Oracle Spatial, grab my fork of the spatial adapter, um, which is not all the way complete, but it's good enough. Um, the URL where you can get it's right at the bottom. Okay. Last tool in the stack before we get on to some interesting stuff. Open layers. It is one of many, it is not the only, but it is one of many JavaScript visualization libraries for spatial data. If you're building a web application and you want to drop a map on a page, this is a great place to start. It supports a lot of the big name uh, WMS services. It supports your own custom imagery. Uh, it supports putting KML into your application. So if you've got something that you spit out of Google Earth and you want to drop it into your application, you can put the KML file into your web app and just pull it in with open layers. Here's a couple examples of some screenshots of uh, open layers pulling in external data. This is not stuff provided by open layers. You can see we're pulling in a Google Maps map here, a Yahoo map here, and layering in an open layers WMS, uh, a big map with another kind of set of base layers behind it. There's a lot of different possibilities. And one of the more important ones for me when I chose open layers was this last one. Um, it's got the ability to pull in maps that are not in your normal projection, your normal Mercator projection. So the applications I was building were, um, I was more interested in having a really good polar view of a map. And Google Maps, Google Earth didn't really do that. Either. So Open Layers was the solution for, for my particular needs, which is one of the reasons that I like it so much. All right. Now, before I get on to the nuts and bolts, I want to show you the last piece of the stack presentation, which is how it all hangs together. So, um, I used to be an enterprise architect before I was liberated and became a Ruby hacker. And enterprise architects um, hide in big organizations and they generally need pictures with three tiers in them to be happy about anything you want to do. So, I've drawn the picture for you. If, uh, if you need to satisfy any kind of enterprise architect or even a, even a, even a guy like me, uh, this is how all of those components that I've just described hang together. It starts down at the bottom where your data sets live. It's going to be PostGIS, Oracle Spatial, MySQL Spatial. Maybe it's KML, maybe, maybe it's Esri shape files. You've got a data layer at the bottom. You pull data out of your data store with Spatial Adapter. Spatial Adapter does a little bit of magic hands it over to GeoRuby, which wraps it in the Ruby data types. Then your application, whether it's a Rails app or a Ruby app or whatever it is, does your awesome business logic. And then you hand it off to some kind of visualization library to show it on the screen. Maybe. Maybe you don't need a visualization library. If you do, that's where you hand it off to the visualization library and present it on the screen. All right. So, in order to get started, if you want to walk out of this room and do some spatial programming hacking today, um, what I would recommend you do is install PostGIS. It's pretty easy. You do this. It's a, it's a standard tarball. You untar it. You configure, make, and make install. A couple more commands. Then you've got your database. Then you want to install GeoRuby and Spatial Adapter. Again, it's pretty easy. Just a couple of gems. Once you do that, fire up IRB and do this kind of thing. You can create points, and if you look at that first line of code, you see that I've got the system reference ID or the projection type specified when I'm creating my point, and then create another point and decide what the distance between them are, or have, the, have Ruby tell you what the distance is between them are. That's your hello world. That's how you know you got all the tools installed. But it does a lot, we can do a lot more than just calculate the distance between a couple of points because frankly, I can do math, you can do math, that's not that interesting. 
GeoRuby can do a ton of other things. It can calculate a bounding box around a data set. That might be interesting for moving your viewport and making it a certain size when you're drawing something on the screen. It can convert your data set into KML, which might be interesting if you're trying to publish your application's data in a file format that you want to pop into Google Earth. It can, it can convert data into GeoRSS. And of course, it plays nice with spatial adapter. There is more though, so why don't we talk about answering really difficult, meaningful questions once we've got our spatial DBMS installed. In a normal relational database, it'd be pretty hard to answer this question. How many freshwater wells are located within five miles of a chemical plant? Let's assume for a minute that we've got a chemical plant table and a wells table, and that they have a geolocation column that has a latitude and longitude in them. It's as simple as writing a query like this. Uh, this is the Oracle spatial syntax, which I'm most familiar with. Trust me, PostGIS can do it too. If you wanted to build that into your Rails application or into a Ruby application, spatial adapter gives you the rich syntax to be able to do something like this. All of a sudden, you've got a geometry method for creating a column. It's as easy as that, and trust me, if you're going to do it by hand in Oracle Spatial, it's not as easy as that. It's a lot of work to actually get a spatial column set up. You can also create spatial indexes down at the bottom, which are interesting ways to create an index uh, where you tell your database that the distance component is part of the index, which is how you're able to answer questions like, what's within five miles of me? You could also do something like this and create a proximity-based finder. You could specify conditions that um, you can expose up to your model that make your model smart enough to know how far you are from other <coughs> objects, which is, again, adding rich support in as, uh, for space as a first-order order programming concept. And a little bit of JavaScript to make the view happen. Um, open layers is pretty simple. This is not supposed to be instructive, just kind of an example of it's pretty easy to drop a map into your application. And that's the stack. So if you wanted to walk out of this room today and get started with spatial programming, those are the tools that you could use. But there's a problem. I'm not that creative. Um, I think a lot of people run into this when they're building spatial applications. This is about the most creative I can get. Can you read that? Um, so, where do we gather our inspiration from? We need to get past uh, just putting dots on math. So, building a spatial application is about finding some interesting data, using it to tell a compelling story, and then being creative about the way we put it on the screen. We'll talk about that first part, finding data. It's all over the place. You just have to look for it. In my travels, I have three favorites. Natural Earth is one. It's my favorite place to go to get raster imagery, vector imagery, demographic data, and other stuff. Data.gov is another great place to go because they have a lot of geocoded stuff, and it's in a pretty consistent format. Easy to get, and it's mostly, uh, it is all free, actually. Um, the last one, geocommons.com, which, uh, full disclosure, they are a client of mine. Uh, they are a place where you can get community driven data sets and maps, and it's all free to use and free to mix up, mash up, reuse, redistribute. And it's a good place to go for in inspiration. Someone knows I'm talking right now and texting. What do you do if all you've got is dots on a map? Well, think about how maybe the time factor can be introduced into your application. Use scale to make the dots more interesting and maybe integrate real-time data into your application. Let's look at an example. <coughs> Veterans Day. So, as a tribute, I've got a map of uh, 2009's Iraq casualties. It's, not, it's um, not a really interesting story when you just put a bunch of dots on a map. 
when you add the temporal slider that's down on the left, and then you give people the capability to interact with your map and put more or less dots on the map, affect the time frame where you're displaying the data from, and maybe play it through as a uh, animated movie, then your story gets a little bit more interesting. As we shift the temporal slider to the right, you can see where incidents have occurred, the relative size of those incidents, and you want to shrink it down to a one week window and then hit the play button, which will happen in a second, I promise. You can see it as an animation, which is a lot more interesting of a way to present your data than just dropping dots on that. But that's not the whole story. So it's pretty good, but it's really not the whole story. If you wanted to tell a more compelling story with the map that I just showed you, you could layer on more pieces of data, and you should. It depends on the story that you're trying to tell. So go out and find it. Maybe you find an infrastructure layer and map roads out. Maybe you add news stories. Maybe you start aggregating your data together. There's a lot of ways to complete the story. It depends on what you're trying to tell. Another way when you only have dots on a map to display to make it more interesting is to make the data you're displaying relevant because it's timely. This is a map created by Kate Chapman, a few comments. What I really like about this map, uh, what it shows is the number of bikes available at a bike share location. Uh, this is for DC, because that's where I hail from. Uh, what I really like about this map is what Kate's done is taken data that is really just a dot on a map and made it really interesting to me because it's up to date by the minute. She's actually pulling in a RSS feed, or I'm sorry, it's a RESTful, RESTful API she uses to figure out what bikes are available by location, and then she shrinks or grows the dot based on how many bikes are available on that particular location. It's very easy to see where the availability is on this map. When you're trying to garner inspiration, you start, need to start thinking like a geographer. Uh, geographers don't think about the positions of individual things. They aggregate things. They look, where things, look for things where they overlap. And geographers really like to tell stories about people. So if you can take those three pieces of information and turn your assumptions on their head, um, you, you may come up with a better story to tell. Geographers, incidentally, also seem to like natural disasters. So here's an example. I think we all recognize this. This is the Deepwater Horizon oil platform's position. Um, when this disaster occurred over the summer, um, there were tons of maps. Uh, I think everybody probably saw the how big is the oil slick compared to where you live application. That was pretty cool. It kind of brought it home to people. Um, that was not the story that this particular user wanted to tell, though. What this particular user wanted to tell was what, how uh, wave heights were affecting the ability to position oil skimmers in the ocean. Again, we're, we're not showing just dots on a map. We're showing areas of interest. And you can see that the story this person is telling is that the oil skimmers had to all be pulled back into harbor on this particular date in history because the waves were too high for them to be on sea. Like I said, geographers, they love natural disasters. Another way you might take free information and build an interesting spatial application is to show areas where things are affected and depending on the story you're trying to tell, use shading and the intersection of things to tell your story. So, in Pakistan, we all remember the flooding that occurred at the end of the summer in Pakistan. It's a terrible natural disaster. Um, this is a map of Pakistan with the waterways shown. And there are five layers of information on this map. Uh, most of them are aligned around provinces. So this one shows you where the most people were rescued. You can see that the, the darkest section of this map is in the middle right quadrant of the country. This one shows you where the most houses were damaged. 
shows you where people were injured. This shows you where casualties occurred. So what's the story of that map? Is it infrastructural? Was it political? Did it have something to do with physical geography? I'm not sure. I would guess that since the data was aligned by province, it had something to do with the relative uh, effectiveness of emergency services on a provincial basis in response to that disaster. So, if you're gonna walk out of this room, you're gonna get started with spatial programming today. These are the four things you need to do. Install your spatial DBMS, get GeoRuby and Spatial Adapter, Find some kind of visualization library. I would suggest you use open layers, or if you are feeling lazy, go over to Geo Commons and try to use their web-based API. And then look for some inspiration and get, get started thinking spatially. All right, that's what I've covered. So I think I have about maybe five or 10 minutes or so for questions. Remember, the people who ask questions first are first in line for the teachers. Uh, yeah, so I'm working on a project uh, which helps developers pair with other developers. Mm -hmm. to, uh, so a developer can log in and say, uh, say, I want to pair with someone, and others can see. Mm -hmm. Now, we're trying to come up with an optimal solution, how, how we can find out uh, uh, which are the pairing sessions which are close to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were looking at post GIS, but uh, one of the uh, one of the co collaborators said uh, it's not supported on Heroku, where we are hosting the site. Uh, that's a bummer. I think that's changed recently, has it not? Okay. So the question the question is, uh, they're working on a site to help developers pair, and uh, pair meaning get together physically, yeah. right, and work together um, on a project. And they wanted to use PostGIS, but the challenge was that PostGIS is not supported on Heroku. Does anyone know if that's still true? I don't. I thought I had heard at Mountain Ruby that maybe that was changing. Okay. I don't know for sure, though. I would think PostGIS would be overkill for that. Oh. Might be. Getting the distance between two points and finding out geographically where two people are is not too hard with a, a GIS. I would think. Yeah, so that's a good point. It, it's the kind of question where, uh, do, you, do you want to go with a full-blown spatial solution, or do you just want to do the math because you know how, right? If you have I a latitude and a longitude, be yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, if you, like a few lines. Yeah, if you have the latitude and longitude of the location of two people, you can run it through a method and figure out how far apart they are. Again, it's when you start going further than that that it gets interesting. Right. How the size shirt do you wear? Um, uh, large. Large. Okay. <laughs> How good is, uh, most of the projects I work on, until you're like, I don't know, getting on a development box or something, you're using SQLite. <laughs> mm -hmm. How reasonable is the implementation of SQLite and does spatial adapter support it? Um, I think you can get by. I, so when I was doing really heavy GIS development, which admittedly was a few months ago, um, when I was doing really heavy GIS development, I had post GIS on my uh, laptop. Right. I think uh, you're right though. Most people do start out with SQLite or something else more lightweight on their workstations. Um, it's enough to get started. I think you'll rapidly run into some right. Well, I'm thinking at least like, you know, I, I would tend to have like one or two people working on the GIS portion and maybe somebody else is doing user interfaces or something and they don't care if it's perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing where, you know, I've had, other project where somebody has Oracle on their box and everybody else is just using SQLite. Yes. That's pretty common. Okay. Yep. Um, what sort of distance functions are available in something like PostJS? And if you have to implement your own distance function, uh, what, would you have to implement that at the uh, database layer? And uh, does, does uh, the adapter provide any capabilities in that regard? Uh, so spatial adapter does not have distance functions built in. Spatial adapter is only doing the conversion of the data types. Um, you can, if you put into your, uh, if you put into your query 
the distance function, you'll have the DBMS do it, obviously. And um, I'm not actually sure about how many different ways PostGIS can do it. I know that uh, SDO distance in Oracle is, is the de facto way to do it. Uh, if you wanted to implement your own distance function, I think you would probably extend it in GeoRuby. And then when your objects were pulled out and turned into Ruby objects, you could invoke uh, spherical distance, Euclidean distance, or my distance, and, and get your own. Right in front. Are there any uh, good tutorials online for way to start with this recording to do away from the question? There are, actually. There's tons. So, um, just at the Ruby level, um, I, I learned quite a bit from Ayur Gordo, which is um, Andrew Turner's blog. He's a really um, prolific writer on the topic. Uh, there are other, lots of other forums. If you are interested in learning about open layers, uh, there's a pretty active community. The documentation isn't great. Uh, the PostGIS documentation is fantastic. So I, I don't have metrics for you. Um, anecdotally, I would say do them in the database. If you can. It, it's going to be faster. It's it's compiled to. Aren't sure. Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was trying to do some stuff with MySQL for um, polygon intersections and things, and I read that the implementation for MySQL turns all your polygons into your bounded rectangles. It's awesome. Uh, <laughs> I read that. There was a, there was a project. Question is, can multiple projections play nicely with each other inside the DBMS? Um, the answer is not in the same column. If you, if, uh, when you declare your column, you are specifying what projection the column data is. If you want to have things in two different projections, put them in two different columns, and yeah, they'll play nice. Sure. Yeah. So. That's another great question. Uh, the question is a follow-up on projections. Um, are different projections good for different things? Uh, why would you choose one over the other? So um, the answer is yes. Different projections are good at displaying different things. When you take a sphere, uh, I'm sorry, a cylindrical projection like a Mercator projection, and you flatten it out, um, that is a really good map for preserving the direction between things. So north, south, east, and west. It is that's that's why most nautical maps have some kind of variation of the Mercator projection. Um, it is not a really good uh, way to preserve the sizes of things. So if you notice, uh, everybody's seen on uh, the Mercator projection map or on the Google Google Maps how Greenland looks bigger than Africa. Now I'm not sure if you guys know this, but Africa is way bigger than Greenland. <laughs> Uh, it's because, but, but the direction that you have to travel between Greenland and Africa is accurate on, on the Mercator projection map. If, you, if your application has more to do with the relative sizes of things, you're going to want a different projection, a different way of unfurling that map. You may want, uh, de depending on exactly what you're trying to preserve, you may want some kind of conic or you may want some kind of uh, planar projection. So yeah, you pick your projection based on the problem you're trying to solve and what you want to remain accurate. Yep? What about altitude? How does that play into this? Clouds or planes? Now, the question is, how does altitude play in? And the answer is that in a spatial system, uh, altitude can be another coordinate if you want it to be. Um, most, uh, most GIS systems, and certainly GeoRuby, have this concept of with a Z and with a measure. So if, you, if your coordinates have a Z measurement, then you've got a three-dimensional point. If you've got a measure uh, measure attribute, then that could be something like altitude or the mile marker along a road or some, some other um, 
some other spatial attribute that's not necessarily a, related directly to the 3D coordinate. Does that make sense? <coughs> like a pipeline. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like a pipeline. All the way in the back. Question is, how does geolocation by IP address fit into this? The answer is, I'm not really sure. I don't know. I don't know. Can you create your own coordinate systems and projections? Uh, yeah, if, it's it's going to be tough to share data with people, and you've got a real lot of implementation ahead of you for the math. So, um, there is a library called the GDAL library, and it's used for translating between your projection and my projection, whatever you're working with, whatever I'm working with. It's used underneath the covers by a lot of spatial systems. Spatial TBMSs use it, um, and you can actually, there's a lot of command line tools you can use to warp data from one projection to another. Uh, you can define your own stuff in there, but again, you're going to um, you're gonna have a lot of implementation ahead of you to do it. Most of those problems have been solved already. Unless you discover something new like, hey, everybody thought the Earth was shaped this way, and I actually have determined through empirical observation that it's got a dent in it over here, um, you, you, you may not want to go through the trouble. Yep? Uh, is the Kuskis being used only like for Earth or other like, celestial body or completely different shapes? Uh, so that's a good question. The question is, can PostGIS be used for other stuff other than the Earth? Other planets or other shapes? Yes. Uh, the geometry is just a geometry. It does not have to be a location on the Earth. If you wanted to represent the shape of this room and store it in a database, you could absolutely do it with lines, polygons, whatever you, whatever you want. If you wanted to pull that into GeoRuby and then calculate the volume of this space, you could do it. You could absolutely do it. Geometry as a function of time. So if you had shapes that were changing over time, where you say, uh, hmm. inside this shape that is done. So if you were trying to capture in your database the uh, shape of an amoeba as it moves around, right. that's a good hard, hard question. Um, I think you would have to define some kind of resolution and take snapshots. I'm not sure that I'm not sure <coughs> in thinking in that fourth dimension just yet. So yeah, the, there, there are a couple ways to do it. So GeoRuby, I think on the GeoRuby slide there were two different ways shown. The spherical distance and then the Euclidean, like through the Earth distance. Um, you, can, you can use either, you can define your own. So one of those ways uses your projection and the other way. So, um, this, that's true, and I think the answer is that, uh, it, yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that question, actually. I think, uh, say again? It's a maybe it's a bad question. No, it's not a bad question. The projection is just how the data is stored. And, like, when it's doing the calculation, when you, like, the great circle, and putting it on this, like, PostGIS has, like, an, like, a perfect sphere, and then a sphere like a sphere like yeah. some shape right here. So the projection is just not a data. It's not how the calculation Yeah, and, and if you look at the Cartesian projection when you're actually plotting the map, right? The points um, at the top of the map and at the middle of the map are spaced in. So you just want to plot them. Right. What else, guys? Uh, if I have data such as GPS uh, for example, for example, 
my running route and I want to store it in my web app, are there any benefits in storing that data in, say, both GIS compared to just storing it as an XML file, for example, and just referring to that? If you want to query against it? Yeah. So if you want to say, um, yeah. so it, it depends on what you want to do with it. If you want to query, on, query against it at the database level and say, uh, you know, find all the intersect points of all of my runs over the course of a week, where, 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 where they all intersect, the places I run past the most, then you'd want to store them in your database. If you're just, uh, you just want to display them on screen, stick them in a file, and then pull that into a local Microsoft Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what else, guys? Back on the arm. What kind of resources are available for taking three to their redirections and mapping them to GIS information? So you're talking about geocoding? There's some geocoding web services out there, and then if you have the Oracle tool set, there's a geocoding command line program. There's there's tons available. If you Google for it, you'll find a bunch. Some of it you have to pay for, some of it's free-ish. There's also like a Ruby binary uh, file that you can, there's like a free version, which is a bit older, and then there's one for fever right. version. I got time for one more, right here. Uh, I noticed that all three of the databases you listed are sort of extensions on classic SQL databases. Is there any sort of inroads this is making into the NoSQL or document database world? So, yeah, Mongo, a bunch of them have it. I, I don't play too much in the NoSQL world, so I might need to ask around a little bit. All right, guys. I want you guys to rate my talk, if you would, please. And you're also allowed to steal it and remix it. All right.